Greetings. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program, Brooklyn Resists Act One, Suffrage, Abolition, and the Untold Stories of Black Women Leaders. This is the first of three programs that look at the long history of the movement for racial justice in Brooklyn. My name is Marcia Eli. I'm the director of programs at the Center for Brooklyn History, which is a proud part of the Brooklyn Public Library. We are absolutely honored to be partnering in this three-part series with New York University's Brooklyn-based 370J project, also the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, the Center for Black Visual Culture, and the Institute for Public Knowledge. For the Center for Brooklyn History, tonight begins the public facing piece of a multi-pronged public history initiative that deeply explores how the protest movement of the present ties to generations of activists and leaders who came before. This project, Brooklyn Resists, encompasses a collecting initiative documenting last summer's protests and those that are ongoing. It will include an exhibition made up of projections on the exterior of our building, which will open on Juneteenth. It will bring you many more public programs and much more. Behind this digital curtain is an extraordinary panel and I am very eager to hear what they have to say. But before I turn it over to them, I want to share a few important notes for you. First, during the course of the discussion, we will be posting in the chat a link to purchase books that our distinguished speakers have authored. In support of Brooklyn's local businesses, our link is to the community bookstore in Brooklyn. I also wanna share that tonight's program can be experienced with closed captions, live transcript. That function is available at the bottom of your screen. And finally, I want to invite all of you to share your questions tonight. Simply type them into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. So on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Center for Brooklyn History, it has been an absolute joy to partner with NYU on this series. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa M. Coleman, NYU's inaugural Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation and Chief Diversity Officer. Reporting to the President, Dr. Coleman works with the Office of the Provost, Deans, other senior leaders and constituents to advance, promote, and build capacity for strategic global inclusion, diversity, equity, belonging, and innovation initiatives across NYU globally. Prior to NYU, Dr. Coleman served as the first special assistant to the president at Harvard University and chief diversity officer. Dr. Coleman, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Marcia. And it is a pleasure to partner, uh, partner with you on this. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I hope that everyone is taking good care. Uh, people keep saying this is the new normal, and I've been saying this isn't normal at all. The stress, health, and of course, that we have to take care of ourselves and others, our colleagues. So I just hope that everyone out there is taking very good care of themselves and others. A lot has happened this year. We're in the midst of uh, health and social crises transformation. Certainly a quick glance at the news will show that for many parts of this country and uh, cases of COVID-19 are on the rise again. We have variations with continued disproportionate impacts among and for marginalized and BIPOC community members. We remain in solidarity to repudiate the ongoing uh, instances of violence and directed toward people of Asian descent and people of African descent. And programs like tonight are crucial to strengthening our historical understandings and our actions, our ability to take action to dismantle uh, and to address inequities. I'd just like to take a moment to honor those lives who've been lost uh, by an acts of violence, as well as those lives of our ancestors who laid down their lives to be, be able for us to be here today. And I'd also like to honor the indigenous lands upon which we all sit. Uh, wherever we may be located. Uh, and so I'll just take uh, five seconds of silence in honor of that. 
Thank you. Again, thank you, Marsha, and thank you, the Center for Brooklyn History for this partnership. Thank you to Ellen Toscano. Uh, Ellen, you are a rock star and uh, you are one of the partners here at NYU. So thank you for your partnership and for your work with uh, the Center for Brooklyn History and in particular with Marsha. Uh, for the NYU Brooklyn-based 370J project, uh, terrific partners, uh, the Center for Black Visual Culture and the Institute for Public Knowledge for partnering with the Office of Global Inclusion on this important program this evening to honor the untold stories of transformational Black women leaders who have forged paths toward justice and equity. We are so excited to partner on this program and it comes at the end of our a year long uh, initiative which was entitled NYU Women 100, which was an opportunity for us to reflect on the ratification of the 19th Amendment by celebrating the untold stories of women who fought for gender equity. And we are thrilled to continue this work uh, by launching a new initiative called NYU Women Lead. It is my absolute pleasure now and honor to introduce our moderator, Jamie Floyd. Jamie Floyd is, is well known as the former local host of All Things Considered and legal editor in the WNYC newsroom. She now also leads WNYC's Race and Justice Unit that covers, new, that covers news through the prism of race, class, and social justice. With a degree from Berkeley Law School, Ms. Floyd taught law at Stanford Law School before embarking on a journalism career that now spans over two decades and has included stints at ABC News, CBS News, and Court TV. She has appeared as a legal and political analyst on as many, on many, many news outlets, including CNN, Fox News, NBC, MSNBC, and, and PBS. I'd now turn it over to you, Jamie, and we're delighted to have you as the moderator tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. Dr. Coleman, I should use your honorific. Dr. Coleman, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and to the Center for Brooklyn History and NYU for having me tonight. Um, and to Marsha Ely, and also to my good friend, Ellen Toscano, especially for inviting me to moderate this panel. I'm very grateful. And I do wanna echo uh, the solidarity that we share with the victims of uh, all violence in this country, and especially the anti-Asian bias and hate crime um, in the country, the solidarity of BIPOC people and women is the way forward from the darkness and into the light. And with that notion in mind, I'll now introduce an extraordinary panel of women who will join us for this conversation, looking at history and that way forward. First, Prithi Kanakamadella is an associate professor of history at Bronx Community College, CUNY. Hello. And welcome and joining us tonight. There she is. I knew she'd turn on that camera. And Thank it's you. good to have you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Her research looks at New York's 19th century free Black communities. And that's not all. She is a public historian and curator. And she's worked with a range of cultural organizations in New York City, including Dan Space Project, Brooklyn Historical Society, now the Center for Brooklyn History, <laughs> at the Brooklyn Public Library, and the Weeksville Heritage Center. Also with us, Michelle Duster. Hi, Michelle. Turn that camera on. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Great to have you. Michelle is Ida B. Wells' great-granddaughter and the author of Ida B. the Queen, The Extraordinary Life and Legacy of Ida B. Wells. I'll ask her a little bit about that. She is a writer, a speaker, champion of racial and gender equity. She co-wrote the children's history book, Tate and His Historic Dream, co-edited Impact, Personal Portraits of Activism, and Michelle Obama's impact on African-American women and girls. And she's also edited two books that include the writings of her great-grandmother, Ida B. Wells. And finally, Kerry Greenidge is with us. Hello, Kerry. Hello, nice to see everybody. 
Carrie is the author of Boston Abolitionists and Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. That was listed as a 2019 top pick by the New York Times. Her scholarship examines African-American and African diasporic politics outside of the postbellum South, particularly through the lens of popular literature and transnational Black press. And we should mention also that Carrie is currently Mellon Assistant Professor in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts University, where, I'm not finished, she also co-directs the African American Trail Project and serves as interim director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. I welcome you all to this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think I'm gonna go in reverse order and start with you, Carrie. We are talking about essentially the forgotten women of the movement, right? And, you know, I could try and answer it myself, but I'm going to ask each of you this same first question. And we're inviting questions, by the way, from the audience. We encourage your questions throughout. But Carrie, first to you, then Michelle, then Priti. Why are these women forgotten in suffrage, in history? Uh, we could even say in the civil rights movement. Why these wonderful women of Brooklyn and throughout our country, why are these unsung heroes, or I guess I should say sheroes or heroines, whatever word we want to use. Why do we have to now say their names? Why haven't we said them before? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Jamie. And my, my, a lot of people in my family are fans of yours, so I, I couldn't <laughs> start without saying that. So anyway, I would say that I think that women um, generally, and particularly African-American women, are um, seen as missing in the historical archive, uh, mostly because of the way that historians have traditionally looked at that archive. So the ways in which we often privilege uh, people who kept papers, for instance, or people who um, were considered kind of the great men of history. And in the past 20 years, the past 40 years, definitely with the rise of Black women's studies in the 1980s, we started to see this rise of people like, um, um, you know, Nell Irvin Painter and, and all of these people who have come before us who have really argued that there's a way to look at the archive that will account for women. So I think it's part, part, that's part of the reason. I also think that we tend to think of women as becoming because of whatever um, gendered roles they had in society during a particular period, we tend to think that means that they were only confined to that gendered sphere that we think of. So I'm thinking of particularly like the 19th century and black women abolitionists um, who were teachers in Brooklyn um, in the 1840s through the 1860s. And um, someone named Georgina Put Putnam who taught in the Brooklyn uh, public schools there. And you know the fact that you really have to go into the newspapers of the time you have to look at other people's papers to really get a full look at someone like uh, Georgiana Putnam's life. And through that, you see she's, she's everywhere in the archive. But it's a matter of kind of looking at and re-examining the archive and redefining what we think of an archive uh, looking like. Thank you for that answer. And I will ask you, Michelle, the same question through the lens, of course, of your very famous ancestor, but so many others who are not known, who are unknown, what would your answer be? Um, I think I would echo what Carrie said. Um, I mean, a lot of it does, it is um, as a result of the way that people have looked at the archives and how they've looked for information. And we're talking about, you know, people who come after these uh, women and are uncovering the history. Um, but then when you talk about for, for them in their present day, the women um, living during their own time, um, I think what you find a lot of times is that uh, women's 
uh, voices were more um, private. So, so a lot of women's stories are told through journals and diaries um, versus sort of public kind of publications. And so there's a different way that the stories need to be um, uncovered now, you know, in, in retrospect and sort of digging through, um, you know, those type of personal kind of um, papers as far as letters and things like that versus public um, kind of documents. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. And, and Ida B. Wells was extraordinary in her public facing uh, way of going about her life, of being in the world, of uh, telling stories, of, of documenting and, and advocating. Uh, but what you speak to, Michelle, uh, is it transcends race for women of, of that era. Uh, and before, most women, as you say, white or black or native, uh, were private people and did not live a public life, were not uh, as courageous, or at least did not have the advantage of being able to uh, publish or write publicly in the same way. Can you speak to that? pick up on what you were just saying about the public versus the private nature of most women heretofore. Um, I'm not sure if I can add too much more. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, that's just a challenge that, that um, historians have when it comes to finding information about people from different generations. Um, but also women um, were involved in women's clubs um, starting from actually the early 1800s. And so um, in order to find this documentation of women's activism um, and engagement with the community and advocating for themselves, that there needs to be a look at um, minutes from meetings. Um, and, and so those are some of the kind of primary sources that people can use. Um, so it's not like the information does not exist. So we have to talk about, has there been a will um, to actually look for this information that actually exists? And so then you have to question who is curating this information and who is making the decisions on what will be included in history textbooks um, and other kinds of publications for today's audience. Um, so there's multiple layers of how and why um, certain people's stories have not been, um, you know, in the forefront of our historical documentation of our country. Mm. Well, Priti, as a, a historian and a curator, that those words certainly must resonate with you. Uh, let me put the same question to you. Why uh, are we still, I would, I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, unaware of so many women uh, who, who did the work, uh, who, who uh, worked for the cause, but very much um, behind the scenes and in the shadows, quietly. Why are we still unaware of their names? Um, why are we still, uh, as Michelle, Michelle suggests, not uh, doing the work of studying that history, digging through those minutes, if you will? Or are we now starting to do that work? Yeah, um, and I just wanted to say, I'm so thrilled to be on this panel. I follow all of your work, so this is so exciting. <laughs> um, but just to agree, I don't know that this is an untold history as our public program suggests. What I would say, and you know, generations of historians, especially black women have been arguing this, it's undertold. Um, these women exist in the archives. Um, historians have been telling these stories, but um, what audiences they've been reaching, how it's been getting into our K through 12 system and then into higher education is a different ball game. Um, I would also just add to what Kerry was saying about the nature of archives. Um, a lot of these uh, women, especially in the 19th century, black women, are bound by both patriarchy and racial capitalism. So by that, I mean, a great deal of their names are often, um, for example, I'm thinking of a Brooklynite Mary Wilson, who was a businesswoman in her own right. Um, she is also an educator during Reconstruction, and she is also part of that voting rights drive. Um, her name throughout the archives is often, when you look in city directories or census records, will be listed as Mrs. W.J. Wilson, right? Those are her husband's initials. 
Um, the same for Elizabeth Gloucester. And so you have countless amounts of black women who are taking on, or not willfully, but they are listed as their um, husband's initials. So that's the patriarchy bit. The racial capitalism bit, of course, is the early archives for 19th century Brooklyn. A great deal of what we know is from things like city directories. And so who would be listed as the head of household? Well, that would be the male figure. Um, there are very few examples in which a woman of any race is listed as the head of the household. And so what the archives start to do just in that sense is erase black women from the archive. And so absolutely, like Michelle and Kerry said, what you need to start doing as a historian, and again, shout out to a number of women historians who have been doing this work for decades now, is you start to have to look at the archive in a radically different way and sort of reimagine the erasures or the silences that are occurring. Mm. So interesting what you say about uh, the husband or father, essentially the owner of the family, right? Uh, the notion that children and wives were property is why the family name in this country, at least, was the name that the family took. And I can remember even as a child, that was the custom. Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. Well, what happened to Jane Smith? The does she no longer have an identity? <laughs> I remember even as a young girl wondering what's going on here. Um, and then my mother got a PhD and the mail would come to Dr. and Mr. James Floyd. <laughs> my father would tilt his head because that was rather unusual for a woman of my mother's generation to be the doctor, but my father was quite a feminist. So things were starting to change. And then eventually they, they no longer had that custom that you were speaking of, Pritzi. But I, I do want to come to you, Carrie, on this notion that Pritzi raises about um, the capitalism and, and the, um, the, the, the male supremacy, if you will, but that the records are there if we dig. And as she says, there have been historians. It's, I love that underreported, not unreported, underreported, because the work is being done, but it's it's not always being championed or or uh, put in our textbooks or celebrated across all platforms, whatever language we want to use. So, what can we be doing to make sure that it is going forward, Carrie? That's a good question. I would say um, that one of the things we can do is uh, like Putty and, and um, Michelle Duster are saying, and again, Michelle Duster, I'm a big fan of your work and we have children in our household who read <laughs> children's books. So once again, but anyway, um, um, you know, I, I would say that one of the things we could do is recognize that women exist and question um, the stories that we assume to be true, where the women are. So if we get to a story, a particular historical moment, and there's absolutely no women in that story to be suspect instead of sort of accepting that that um, is the truth. Um, I think also getting back to this notion of the archive and what it looks like and, you know, looking at like census records, one of the things in my own um, just research is the notion of even questioning the makeup of the archive itself. So looking at, you know, when somebody was doing census reports through the 19th century, the way the census was taken was that somebody was visiting the home and recording, that person was recording who they saw in the household. And so questioning, and there's a lot of work that's been done on this, you know, questioning well, what does that mean that the person who's visiting an apartment in Brooklyn in 1880 is just recording who they see in the, in the building. And so, you know, starting to question the relationship. So you might find that the household, the head of household is listed as a man, and then the women are, you know, assumed to be a wife or a daughter, but, you know, really peeling back layers of, well, what was that actually true, right? And then having to go to other sources and kind of um, to look at what these women's lives actually looked like. And, and, and speaking to the idea of um, journals and uh, diaries, if you can find them, one of the things that, that is fascinating also, particularly when you get to the later 19th century, is the um, newspaper records. And so Black women appearing in newspapers, having columns, and then Black women actually producing their own newspapers. Uh, Woman's Era was one of them. 
um, produced in, in Boston. You also had uh, a column that was in the Brooklyn Eagle that was produced. You had the New York Age had a woman's column. And so really going into what Black people and communities were reading um, at a given moment of time, which were the weekly newspapers. And in there, you see women all over the place, you know, writing in about their families, writing about their complaints, excuse me, <laughs> writing in about how it is that they view a certain um, um, issue. And so it's a matter of expanding what we think of as an archive, as opposed to assuming that um, census records and the records that we look at are telling the entire story of the lives of the people who they claim to uh, record. I love that you mentioned the newspapers and the women newspapers, women's newspapers, and that legacy of Ida B. Wells. Uh, we do have a question uh, for you, Michelle. Uh, Raul asks, how were the women's clubs organized and what role, if any, did Brooklyn have in the founding of the National Black Women's Club movement? And I guess anyone can answer that question, but Michelle, you did mention the women's club, so maybe you want to take a stab at answering that one. Right, well, um, um, I'm sure everybody can uh, join in this, in this uh, answer. Um, I mean, from what I understand about how women's organizations or clubs were formed was simply a group of women um, would make a decision to, to um, organize and um, you know, uh, formally become a group. Um, that would, you know, be focused on a certain issue or certain um, aspects of, you know, uplifting um, their own situation. So um, as far as I know, um, there wasn't like a formal kind of, um, you know, like you have to get a, a license or anything like that. I mean, it was just, um, you know, make a decision and, and uh, create um, an organization. Um, I mean, there was, I know in some situations, there were charters that were created around um, this type of organizing, but I'm sure there were organizations and clubs that were not le legally and formally chartered. Um, so, you know, that would be uh, maybe that in, th in those situations, um, those type of organizations would, um, you know, not necessarily receive the same level of um, credibility or, you know, being documented because they weren't formally, um, you know, um, created into some kind of legal entity. And they were not um, unique to Brooklyn, but they were significant in the life of Brooklyn women, were they not, Michelle? Yes, um, they were definitely significant. We have to remember that um, until, uh, it, with few exceptions, you know, um, most women um, out, did not have the right to vote until 1920. I mean, obviously there were individual states, like Illinois, I have to give a shout out to Illinois where uh, women gave the right to vote in 1913. Um, but overall, you know, the great majority of the states, women did not have the right to vote. And so they used the club um, movement and the um, women's clubs as a way of having some kind of um, political engagement and um, some form of um, empowerment. And so, you know, this was a, the club movement was a way for these women to um, address some of the issues that were very specific to their um, particular situations. And they would use the collective um, of a club in order to put pressure on, um, you know, political decision makers. And so, you know, that was what they could do without having the right to vote. Speaking of the right to vote though, Carrie, I have to come around to this um, issue of black women and the right to vote versus the suffrage movement and the right to vote that came to white women in 1920, because the rest of us were still waiting <laughs> until 1965 to, to truly have the right to vote. You know, mm -hmm. the, the real enfranchisement that came with the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and that tension within the movement. I mean, we even saw it when the statue was unveiled in the park, Central Park. I call it the park, of course, because I live in New York and I think it's the only park there is. Um, but the, the statue, which used to be, by the way, 
you know, Seneca Village, which was a largely black, I just want to give a shout out to the people that were there and then they moved them out and then they put the park. So there's that whole history. We could do a whole program on that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the tension within the movement, Carrie, and the untold history of that tension when we see all these beautiful Hollywood pictures about suffrage. Isn't there a movie we could be making about black suffrage for women? There definitely is. And I'm thinking of the kind of the recent work by people like Martha Jones and all the all these historians who have come out with very sort of di dissecting this, this um, the ways in which the right to vote has been um, contested from the beginning. And one of the things we know is that even during the early and mid 19th century, and I'm sure Prithi can speak to this um, as well, given your research, is this notion that um, even in the anti-slavery movement, for instance, the New York um, Anti-Slavery Society that was founded in the 1830s did not allow black women to uh, attend, right? And so the black women, the black women who wanted to be a part of the anti-slavery movement in the 1830s um, had to join and create their own groups. Uh, by the time you get to the 1880s, the sort of whole impetus for this black women's club movement was the fact that black women were systematically excluded from clubs that were rising up amongst women. So women were organizing clubs to um, assist in terms of child care and in terms of poverty and in terms of education and in terms of um, wealth and family networks and black women were systematically excluded so there's a New York woman named Victoria Earl Matthews who organized um, something called the White Rose Mission um, by the 1890s um, after her death there was a branch in Brooklyn um, and that gave rise to the black women's club movement which produced the National Association of Colored Women in 1896 which became kind of the main vehicle for black women across the country to mobilize in terms of political and in terms of their communities. Um, and so by the time you get to the right to the right to vote officially in 1920, there was this long, you know, over a century of history of black women in their communities, organizing around their clubs, organizing in their communities, uplifting themselves, um, 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 voting in the ways that they could. So one of the things we know is that black women and women might not necessarily be able to vote in their state, but they could vote, for instance, in New York State, in Massachusetts, um, in Illinois, and in Ohio on the local level. So you could vote, say, in a school department, um, and th that became a huge area where black women, particularly in Brooklyn, would vote for members, uh, black women to serve on the local school committee. Um, so we have to kind of revise the way we look at women's suffrage and particularly black women's suffrage because women did not get the right to vote until 1920. African-Americans, uh, Asian-Americans, uh, people, Latinos did not get the, and Native Americans, of course, did not get the right to vote until um, barriers were um, alleviated in 1965, but we have this whole history of Black women um, and Black communities um, mobilizing about about making their voices heard in ways that um, can be obscured when we look at specifically just 1920. And so, um, you know, the, the the women's movement, women's suffrage movement, being um, a, a source of controversy for many African American women. And here I'm thinking, you know, of, of course Ida B. Wells, but also um, someone like. Um, um, a, a Mary Church Terrell, who was a president of the National Association of Colored Women, who said, look, black women can't vote, but yet they were the center of their communities. And therefore they tried to use whatever means they could to affect political change. And I, I really appreciate your mentioning others who were disenfranchised. I mean, not just black women, but others, non-white, non-white is really the thing uh, in this one drop society that we had and in some ways still have. Uh, and, and Prithi, as, as was said, you uh, can speak to this as well. And I'm going to ask you to speak to the same uh, part of our history, the tension within the suffrage movement, but I'm going to ask you to do so off of a question that Emma has, which is about the evidence of interracial work among 19th century churches in Brooklyn, which she says she can find through newspapers, but then she goes on to say, I have not come across stories of black women in Brooklyn working with women of other races or being joined by white women. Are there any stories in the 19th century of women's interracial work? Um, that's a great question. So um, I think just to sort of piggyback on what everybody's been saying, the long history of organizing in Brooklyn really does belong um, or start as we understand it in the early 19th and mid 19th century. And by that, I mean, for somebody like Ida B. Wells to be able to come to Brooklyn in the late 19th century, early 20th century and have um, 
people, black women fundraise for her publications and for her work. Um, that is Maricha Lyons. Maricha Lyons' mother was Mary Joseph Marshall. Uh, Mary Joseph Marshall, we know, um, fundraised constantly in the mid 19th century with um, the Brooklyn resident, Elizabeth Gloucester. And what were they fundraising for? They were fundraising for institutions, the Colored Orphan Asylum, various churches. And it wasn't just a fundraise for the organization itself, but what those spaces represented in 19th century New York and Brooklyn. So in terms of fundraising for Shiloh Presbyterian Church, which, st which still exists today, of course, um, they're organizing for the right to space, right? To the right to practice faith um, safely, but they're also um, organizing to fundraise so that those spaces can remain open where people can mobilize around the voting issue. They can mobilize around um, issues of democracy, issues of land ownership. And so what I mean by saying all of that is the, hi the history of Brooklyn specifically is really the history of black women organizing, not so much in Manhattan. The history of New York is a slightly different one and it really does kind of follow the history of abolition and women organizing in other Northern cities i.e. it was somebody like an Abby Hopper Gibbons um, organizing alongside other black women like Mary um, Joseph Marshall. Um, in Brooklyn, it's a particularly unique story in that it was really black women at the center and you would occasionally find that they formed alliances with other white women, but that history doesn't come till much later. And I'm thinking more like the 1860s, 1870s. So by the 1870s, you already have 70 years in Brooklyn's history of black women really pushing forward the notion of what will democracy look like in this experiment called the United States? And how can we really think about what um, racial um, and um, social justice will look like for our community? Um, so again, thinking of Mary Joseph Marshall, her daughter is Maritza Lyons, and then she, when she grows up, she will fundraise for Ida B. Wells, and it keeps going. Um, and of course, Maritza Lyons and um, Victoria L. Matthews is at the center of Black suffrage in Brooklyn. Well, we do have Michelle Duster with us, so we, we have to take advantage <laughs> of, of this opportunity and, and, and spend, spend a a little bit of time talking in depth about Ida B. Wells. Uh, I, I think I'm going to assume that that most people, if not everyone who who is joining on the Zoom, you know, understands the broad outlines, Michelle, of uh, Ida B. Wells' uh, story. Uh, and, and certainly, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, Ida B. Wells is one of my sheroes. So I think I've got the broad outlines, you know, born in Mississippi. Uh, I think everybody knows the, the, the lawsuit against the train company, that, that sort of uh, it, courageous uh, story, uh, the journalism, um, the, the, um, the, the um, travel internationally, I mean, really, come on. Um, but can you take us to New York? Can you uh, pick up on the part of the story that Prithi was just talking about and the, the fundraising for her causes and just take, take us to Brooklyn and, and help us to, under because I grew up in New York and I never really thought that much about that intersection of her, that part of her story. Um, and you can tell it in a very personal way. And we'd like to hear it if you wouldn't mind sharing a few minutes of that. Well, I mean, we have to remember that my, my great grandmother, Amy Wells, um, came, went to Brooklyn, um, to, well, to New York. Um, after, after she was at, uh, attended a conference, a, a church conference in Philadelphia in 1892, um, which was only a couple of months after her friends um, had been lynched. Um, the uh, three men who owned the grocery store and, and my great grandmother used her voice in the newspapers to um, advocate for people to um, boycott white owned businesses and boycott the streetcar company in Memphis. And um, for those who could afford to actually just leave Memphis uh, because there was a feeling that there was no way to get justice in a city where the, per the people who were the lynchers were also part of the uh, law enforcement. 
So, um, you know, she, so she basically, you know, just kept pushing the envelope um, and making um, the power structure uncomfortable um, to the point where they felt the need to threaten her life. Um, and so she happened to be out of town in Philadelphia when she, after she wrote a, a, an editorial, um, which was considered to be you know, explosive, I guess, um, uh, that um, insinuated that liaisons that happened between black men and white women were not necessarily um, forced, <laughs> um, that they were um, consensual. And um, so she, she was in Philadelphia, um, I guess for a couple of days. Um, she's not clear, I mean, I can get these information from what she wrote and some things are not, you know, um, in other sources. Um, but then she went to New York City because um, according to her, she had never been outside of the South um, at this point in her life. And she met with T. Thomas Fortune, who is the one who told her that um, she couldn't go back to Memphis because her printing press had been destroyed and there was uh, a price for her head. Um, and so he offered her um, the opportunity to write for the New York Age. And in that, um, she took the advantage of um, she took advantage of that opportunity and started and wrote a series of columns in the New York Age about what was going on regarding lynching, around the, the realities of the um, absolute lawlessness and um, barbarism um, that was taking place domestic, domestic terrorism, and um, so she. Um, you know, tapped into a community, obviously, of, of club women who were very welcoming to her. And they're the ones who um, not only helped her raise the money to translate her, or so to say, transform her um, articles, the series of articles that she wrote for the New York Age to convert it into a pamphlet. And so they helped her raise the money to, um, you know, pay for the printing costs and all that to make, to convert it into a pamphlet. But they also are the ones who um, organized um, speaking engagements for her. Um, and so um, she, she writes in her autobiography about how welcoming they were and how, um, they, they basically created um, an entree for her to, to be um, embraced in this community of women organizers. Um, and that's what ultimately led her to have the opportunity to, um, to go overseas because there was a woman in the audience at one of her speaking engagements who was from Britain um, and heard her speak and, um, and ultimately invited her to uh, go to Britain to um, help educate the British about what was going on. So the women in, in um, New York City were very instrumental in helping my great grandmother propel herself to the national and international leader that she became. And Brooklyn in particular. Yes, it was absolutely Brooklyn. Um, but she does say in her autobiography that there was there was a big divide or not, oh, maybe I shouldn't say big divide, but there was a little division between Brooklyn women, um, club women and Manhattan based. And, um, and they actually came together and, um, and were able to, or willing, you know, to work together and collaborate um, across that, um, you know, the, the outer borough. Well, actually at that point, Brooklyn was considered a separate city from, from Manhattan. So um, yeah, I mean, so she, uh, so the women did, um, you know, organize together and um, create this opportunity for her. And they ever, she writes about how they gave her a pen um, that was um, in the shape of, uh, uh, I think it was in the shape of a pen. And then they made the invitations that looked like little um, pamphlets and, <laughs> um, and her name was in lights. And so she really, um, really appreciated all of the work that the women um, in Brooklyn did to, to um, help elevate her work. Hmm. It's interesting when I hear, Harry, when I hear that um, reflection on, you know, Brooklyn and Manhattan and, and truly separate cities back then, right? But there's still that, um, I don't know, historical sense that, that remains that these are two separate places in some ways, right? A different um, sensibilities, different uh, cultures, 
right? Just, just across the bridge, it's a different culture. Um, and now it's somewhat in fun, but I think it descends from that time. It's not that long ago. It's not that long ago, right? And I think it plays out in our politics and in, in what goes on in these different places and how we choose to live. Um, and, you know, we started talking uh, about how this is, you know, unknown and then Prithi right, rightly said, no, just underreported, not unreported. Um, but do you think that most folks who are walking around Brooklyn know all of this good history about these women? Even, even Ida B. Wells, a name everybody does know. I think, um, <laughs> oh, go, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say really quickly, I've met an enormous number of people who um, never heard of Ida B. Wells before they went to college or graduate school. Um, and so for those who don't go to college or graduate school, they might never hear of her. So, I mean, among some circles, um, she is extremely well known, um, but among other circles, they've never heard of her before. But they've heard of, you know, some other people who, you know, want to, who people want to call queen, um, you know, today. Um, so, um, you know, it just depends on what, what, what you're doing with your life and what circles you're kind of um, engaged in. That, that as far as how well known certain things are. Mm, mm, good point, good point. I, I, my daughter used to come home talking about those Kardashians mm -hmm. and I would say, which was very young. And so I said, can you, can you name uh, a woman who's on the US Supreme Court? Because until you can name the women who are on the US Supreme Court, I don't want to hear about the Kardashians. <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally she had her Sotomayor and the others down and I let her alone. Um, so, so I do have a follow-up, Carrie, that's from the audience. Um, <laughs> my poor daughter, I hope she's not on this call. Um, <laughs> so, the, and it is, it is picking up on, on what Michelle was just talking about. Um, it is, how do we get, uh, and I wanna give the shout out to the person who's asking the question, Lisa. Uh, Carrie, how can we get these untold stories into the history books? How can we encourage students to read or research the stories written by BIPOC people and about our people. Well, there, it's a good question. I think that I think we're we're one of the the we're lucky enough to live in a time, and we're also cursed to live in a time where we do have the internet. Um, um, and I think one of the 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 double edged sword of that is that it is possible now. I mean, I, I I don't have children of my own, but I live with my nieces, and being able to go on like and just do a Google search and find children's books, um, find um, um, names of historians who we've mentioned here today, and and follow up on it, right? And follow up on um, um, the names that we, we mentioned and look them up and find the books that they've written. I also think that there's a, a wonderful intersection um, presently with kind of the arts and people who do stuff with, you know, uh, fiction and poetry and history. And so stressing to particularly young people that you don't have to, if you're somebody who does not particularly like sitting down and reading a history book, right? There's a lot of ways that you can read uh, historical fiction, you can read um, poetry um, that is going to place you into, whoops, sorry, because it's gonna place you into the time period and give you a look at the history. So I'm thinking of, you know, there's there's wonderful rise of graphic novels that are out now um, for younger people, particularly, I'm thinking of younger people in my own family who initially would say, ah, I don't really like history. And you kind of give them these, these graphic novels. Um, there's one that's all about, um, 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 Black Wall Street and mm -hmm. um, being able to read those types of things. And that's a good in entry into, into the history. But I do think, I do think that, that we live in a moment where it can do two things. We, people have so much access to information so it can either go wrong and be misinformation or you, somebody who wouldn't necessarily be the person who knows about Ida B. Wells can Google and can go on to whatever website, go to the bookstore that you've put up here in the chat and say, I wanna find this book and be able to find a book and find resources. So, so I think it's a matter of just getting uh, people kind of put the names and the concepts into people's minds. And once that happens with events like this, 
then you get people who will follow up, but not necessarily in ways that will be, that might be for everybody sitting down and reading a history book. It might be that, you know, you listen to a podcast or you um, read a children's book or you listen to an album, right? Um, and so there's a lot of work that's being done by artists and scholars at this very moment that people are taking advantage of. And in case, Lisa, you missed the very beginning of the conversation, uh, <laughs> Michelle Duster has a, uh, the wonderful children's book that she co-wrote called Tate and His Historic Dream. So Carrie is right to suggest that children can be brought into history uh, early on with, with children's books. Um, but Prithi, I think you had started at the very beginning uh, by mentioning history and how our curricula so often, you know, that's where it begins. Um, for so many people, and as Michelle said, if you don't go on beyond middle school or high school, you might not ever hear, unless you're raised in a family where your mother says, Ida B. Wells, you might never hear that name. So what can we do to ensure that our schools are teaching uh, the, the real history of Brooklyn in Brooklyn? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say the history of Brooklyn is relevant to the entire country. Brooklyn was the third largest city in the United States just before the Civil War. So this was not just another town or another city in the country. Um, it was producing an enormous amount of wealth for the United States. Um, I would just honestly piggyback on what Carrie already said. I, you know, at CUNY have a number of students come to me saying, Professor, I'm just taking your class as a requirement. I hate history. And without fail, um, I can say to you most of the reason I was not a history person K through 12. And it's because of the way in which our histories are taught. Um, so much of what we're taught is about learn the name, learn the date and learn the place. And that's all you need to know. And as Kerry was saying, some of the best work being done right now in historical narratives are artists and writers who understand the fundamental work of historians is interpretation. That is what we do. Um, historians are just uh, another word for great storytellers. That's essentially what we put on a page is a story. Um, so I think the work needs to be done. If you're an educator, the work needs to be done in thinking, how do you um, create situations for students that invite them in by using graphic novels, um, by showing them the archives themselves rather than textbooks. Um, I do think the other thing uh, we can all be doing, um, and it comes out of all of the social justice movements happening like right now, Black Lives Matter, for example, is start to think of our history as networks. So much of what we do um, in terms of historical narratives is you get one or two people who make it to the top. I'm thinking always of Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman. And what we don't do enough of is put them back into their networks. Um, we talked, you know, Ida B. Wells, um, her success is made possible in New York because of the range of men and women she meets here who will kind of propel her to the next level of her career. Um, and that happens throughout Brooklyn's history. Brooklyn was all formed on networks, making networks both within Brooklyn and also thinking about how can we create partnerships or networks with people in neighboring Manhattan, up in Boston, out in Philadelphia. So just constantly thinking, I think of our histories as being more nuanced and definitely in terms of networks, multiracial, multi-ethnic networks as well. I, and of course, as we push up against the time limit, the questions start flooding in. Uh, <laughs> they've been coming in the whole time, but I have a couple more. So I'm gonna try and get them in. Um, one is about Duffield Place. Oh, immediately recognition, excellent. Um, so recently the city's Landmark Preservation Commission, this is the question, uh, accorded, this is such a good question. Uh, the city's Landmark Preservation Commission accorded landmark designation to a house on Duffield Place. I'm coming to you, Prithi, I see you nodding, in downtown Brooklyn for its relay, oh, you too, okay. Uh, for its relationship to the history of the Underground Railroad and the abolition movement. In this area is, I think it means to say, is this area of Brooklyn particularly relevant to the history of Black women suffragists and abolitionists? And if so, how can we raise the awareness of this history in the public monuments of the city? 
So why don't we, since you both seem to know it, uh, Prithi, how is it relevant to the history of black women suffragists and abolitionists? And then Carrie, why don't you tell us how we can raise awareness about it for the rest of the city to understand its significance? Prithi, go. Um, so the relevance of 227 Duffield, which is a specific house that was saved, um, is that abolitionists, two white abolitionists actually lived there, and they hosted William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. And we know that that whole area of downtown Brooklyn um, was very much part of um, an anti-slavery network. Um, most of the research that I did as part of In Pursuit of Freedom, which looked at the anti-slavery network of Brooklyn is still up on a website, pursuitoffreedom.org. Um, it is all still there. How it relates to suffrage, I don't wanna to step too much on Kerry's response, but there are a whole team of organizers, researchers and activists working right now in Brooklyn to make those connections and to make sure a monument to black women's suffrage does appear in downtown Brooklyn. So anybody, because we've been talking about Google, can Google it and you will find that the, um, the team and the organizers immediately come up and they are making those connections. And Carrie, how can we get the word out? How can we be sure that people understand the importance of this history, this historic place, and this history we've been talking about uh, in our city? Yes, I think, and I was nodding my head just because it was one of the, those articles that I saw that I was, I was sort of like privately cheering for as a historian. Um, I think one of the things that people can do is visit your local site. So, you know, the Brooklyn <laughs> Historical Society having this right now, um, um, Weeksville um, Historical Society and sort of the people who work there at that, that uh, Black community there, library resources. So going to the public library and just looking at, say, um, um, uh, maps and and stuff and so if 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 as a community and I tell this to my students up here in Boston all the time if is if as a community you um, start to learn about what the community the shapes of it throughout history look like in a very positive way so you're reading you're using the resources you're going to the historical society um, that's often how people get historical um, sites preserved is that it's sort of people in the community who say I discovered this myself and I know um, I don't know if that's this particular history of of, of Duffield Place, but I do know that that's the way that a lot of historic sites are preserved in a community is because people themselves, just average people go and say, I've been going to the library, I've been passing this building, I've been reading about this, and so now I'm going to contact, um, you know, the a historical society or a phil philanthropic society or a some type of you know university and I'm going to say this deserves a plaque or to be a, to, to be commemorated so I think we we tend to think that that's just kind of professional historians and professors who do that type of stuff and I think one of the joys of public history in particular is that members of the public responding to their community and saying this is what deserves to be preserved yeah, yeah there's a, a long-standing push to preserve uh, the original uh, home of the NAACP down in Greenwich Village. Um, and I think it will probably be successful, but it's been a community effort to get that established. Uh, I have a great final question for each of you to answer. Um, and it, it is this, each of you have mentioned the ways that, de that definitions of archives and the questions that are asked shape the stories told, who they are told by, and who is centered in those stories. What would you say to emerging historians and those who interpret history to learn and tell the undersold stories as we go forward in history? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, this is gonna be our closing thought. Um, so I thank each of you as we go into that closing thought. And I, I guess I'll start with you, Michelle, Duster, um, as someone who has written for children and adults and who comes from this, this extraordinary legacy, what would you say to those who are going to tell our, our, tell our stories um, as we move forward in time? Um, you know, it's gonna be interesting. You're talking about us today, like who's in the future, who's gonna tell our stories? Yes, yes, to, to, um, to try to get it right and be inclusive in ways that- That's going to be interesting, um, considering that very few people today write physical letters. Um, I mean, I do wonder, you know, how, how you know, our communication will be um, accessible um, in, you know, a hundred years from now. Um, but, 
I mean, I just think that, you know, kind of repeating myself as far as um, what, what people need to do now in order to make the stories of our ancestors or predecessors um, more well known is to, as, as Carrie and Prithi both said, I mean, think outside of the box of how, um, you know, if you want to call it traditionally, um, you know, uh, histor history has been um, uncovered, documented, and even deemed um, worthy of, of being, um, you know, it, included and um, been interpreted. And so, you know, there just has to be um, a broader way of, of classifying and defining what is considered significant. Um, and, and framing it in, in different ways, because women, um, the way, the way that women, um, wielded whatever power they had was in a different way than men did. And so it has to be interpreted in a different way, um, than the way that men operated. And so people just need to, um, be flexible and creative when it comes to, um, figuring out ways to, um, tell women's stories and through the frame of the women who themselves as individual people and not only framing them as the wife of or the mother of um, somebody, which is unfortunately way too often how um, they're always the help, as, a, as a Martha Jones says, you know, it's the help meets um, versus the, the woman in and of herself of, of being the, the um, history maker or the, or the historical figure. Carrie? Um, I would say that one of the things in terms of um, um, archive and how you would be using sort of the archive to, to study history is I think really um, going, looking for stories by reimagining re what we think of what an archive looks like. So one of the things to do is to read, you know, books that were written by um, African-American people, not the, not the people that we normally think of, you know, James Baldwin or, you know, a Toni Morrison, but look at, you know, writers who were um, uh, producers in their time period, poetry that people were writing, um, newspapers that I keep on bringing home, maps. Um, one of the things I like my students to do is go and, well, look, what, what was a map of this neighborhood back in 1850? And so how did it change over time? And, you know, even tracing like one person in your own family history for, through, through the census and seeing how that person changed over time. Um, so, I, so I would say sort of broadening what we think of as an archive and what we think of as a record um, and using whatever we see as kind of evidence from a time period to chronicle the people in that time period. Um, I, would I would just say sort of a, people I see in the chat, people who are educators, um, for younger people, a fascinating way to do this is just have them look up a name, right? Mm -hmm in go to, if you have access to like ancestry and say, we're gonna look up a name and a date and just have them trace that, right? That's a historical project you're doing, right? And you're teaching them that they're, you know, the, 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 the name, the person, the place um, existed in a context that they might not necessarily, necessarily think of when they're walking down, you know, um, the street and they're getting on the A train, right? You know, there's a different, there's a, the, the, there's a way that you can have people really dive into what the archive holds and then have them see that it's more than just what you would think of an archive would look like. And there are ways to, to find these people uh, that you might not necessarily be looking for. Great ideas. Carrie, that was wonderful. And Prithi, you are our last um, one to take a tackle at future history. Is there such a thing, future history? Histories, I'm not sure, but I will try it in, uh, in less than a minute. I would just say um, the thing that white supremacy does exceptionally well is it erases our shared histories, our shared struggles, um, and our shared joys and moments of solidarity. And if we have learned anything from recent events, especially in terms of anti-Asian American violence and anti-Black violence, it is that our histories truly come alive when we celebrate those moments and we acknowledge those moments that are transnational, that are beyond borders, in which communities of color have always found ways to work together in this country. Um, so I think in moving forward and thinking about our histories, it's the same framework. It works for 19th century history if you really look for it. Um, and it looks, looks to our sort of present and future as well. 
Hmm, a wonderful, wonderful closing thought. Uh, and so I'll say thank you uh, to all three of our panelists, Michelle Duster, Carrie Greenidge, and Priti Kanakamadella, and also to the Center for Brooklyn History and NYU, which invited us all to be here today. And I look forward to working with all of you three women in partnership going forward. Thanks for being with us today and for your thoughts and your time. Thank you very much, everybody. Nice to see everybody. And to our audience. <laughs>